just make sure. All right, super. Uh, hey, everybody, welcome back to the Jet Center podcast. It's Liz. Sorry. Uh, hey, what's up? Hey, I was about to watch The Lion King. You want to come? Not right now. <laughs> <laughs> sorry i had to when I, I was like okay at the dinner table i was like we gotta find a way to make this <laughs> i'm gonna milk this as long as possible so i appreciate it who was that that was my little brother <laughs> your little brother that's awesome <laughs> um yeah so anyways uh, maybe we'll start with talking a little bit about that that's kind of been marat's five minutes of awkward weird hilarious fame that everyone is just enjoying they think it's so much fun um the the iconic gif that's almost as funny right now as the 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 small Maurice wave. Um, Cole Perfetti has been very good um, with the Moose as of late. He scored his first goal um, in their first game. I think he scored his first goal there, and he's been playing um, with um, a couple of guys. The forward core we know with the Moose is not the strongest that um, it has been, but the D looks pretty good. Uh, some of those guys we wanted to see on the Jets. Um, have you been watching the Moose much? Do you know much about what's going on there? Um, any exciting stories to bring forward to the Jets fans? Well, yeah, I've been watching a little bit of Moose. I think I've watched three full games and chunks of other ones um, in an attempt to get a sense of what the new King uh, Cole Perfetti will bring to the table or kind of how just his transition is going. And you know, I mean, Hanola and Sandberg are playing on the top pair more or less and, and getting all kinds of opportunities like that's something that every Jets fan is going to want to see someday it's easy to imagine that in the long run um in Winnipeg I guess um even though like they need to get their NHL opportunity first maybe as soon as next season at this rate I think um but o- overall I've just been trying to stay abreast of it I haven't reported anything I haven't um, maybe maybe it's the Lion King gift that has really just shut me down from from really putting my AHL thoughts out there. But I've been just taking some notes, watching some games, and trying to have fun with it. For sure, yeah, and it's less your area of required whatnot, so it makes sense. But uh, yeah, it's good to see uh, some good stuff coming down there. Been nice to watch some of those games, especially since we haven't when we hadn't had hockey for so long. People were excited to watch any level, so it's been nice. Um, but yeah, hockey is back. We haven't uh, had you on here since the season started. There have been about a million and one things to cover in the whatever 18, 19, 20 games that we've played. I feel like there have been more storylines this season already than there have been in the past like two years of the Jets playing. So there's so much uh, to unpack. Uh, we've done a couple of episodes since it started. We had our report cards. I was thinking maybe we'd start there. We did report cards similar to what you did um, on The Athletic. I was very proud of myself personally after reading your article because a lot of our grades aligned and I was like, oh, good for me. <laughs> um, but I thought um, you gave a lot of incompletes, which I thought was fair. I felt that a lot of my assessments I know personally were kind of based on like three games and I was either hard on people or I gave them a lot of praise just for a very small sample. But um, who have been some of the guys that you've kind of been excited about this year that you've seen um, good things from and then also that you expect to be good or to decline in performance in the coming games and coming months yeah it's been a bit of a wild one in terms of well actually let me back up I, i'd like to think that that was a great minds moment for the for the two of us if we were more or less on the same page i hope that's what that was um last year when we did report cards it was connor hellebuck and everyone else basically from start to finish i mean as soon as november hit it was connor hellebuck a plus everybody else well they're trying um, and then in this, in this year, I don't think it's been quite as clear cut on that. I mean, there have been, um, he was still one of my top rated players. And I think he's going to continue to be a great player for Winnipeg. I mean, he is still facing a lot of shot quantity. He's still facing a lot of shot quality. Winnipeg's still winning. So, I mean, clearly he's having a, a strong season, if not a dominant one thus far. Nick Ehlers started out on fire. So he was my, my early season um, MVP candidate not just play driving, not just speed and zone entries, but tons of points, tons of um, like hard plays before he became this noted Corey Perry fighting goon. I guess he already had, was it Ryan? It wasn't Ryan Kessler. It was Ryan Getzlaff. And then also that's the one people people keep bringing up, but the Tyson Berry one was funnier to me. I thought that one was hilarious a few years ago when he absolutely clocked Tyson Berry on the blue line in front of the bench when he was playing with the abs. This was like four years ago. 
Oh, wow. Yeah. Somehow I don't even have like, what's the play by play of that? Did it, that turn into a fight? What was the deal there? It, no, it, it was a fight where he absolutely decked him. It was like somebody else started it behind the net and they just happened to be nearby and all four, like the eight other guys were fighting. So they just started going at it and he, he absolutely destroyed him in like three seconds. It was so weird. <laughs> maybe that's the kind of confidence that like leads you to believe that you can continue to take on bigger and bigger heavyweights I mean Nick Ehlers is not a player I would have ever have thought to drop the gloves nearly so frequently but I guess I mean at this point he was beating Patrick Laine when Laine was still in Winnipeg there's a storyline um anyway uh other other stat outs for me not in a like MVP sort of way but Derek Forbert went from a huge question mark for me to a guy that's half of Winnipeg's, I don't want to say only good pairing because that's not kind, but... But only the, good pairing. <laughs> only pairing that has been consistently reliable against top opposition. How's that? It might okay. sound yeah. a little different to some years, but um, yeah, Winnipeg seems to be the Pionk forbert pairing, Morrissey and whoever he's playing with that night and then a third pairing that gets extremely sheltered. I just think that Forbert, you know, he he was a third pairing defender for Calgary in the playoffs last year. He had injury trouble. He hardly played during the regular season. I mean, coming back from a back injury is tough for anybody. So I think that there was a huge, like, stretch of, I, I want to say error bars or projection error in, in terms of, like, how good he was going to be. And that he's had success, that's huge, I think, has helped a lot. Um, I think... The world was a little bit quick to get down on Paul Stastny for the first couple of games when he hadn't scored a lot, but I think that he's quietly been very, very good. Like there's certainly he's not a point per game star anymore, but age hasn't particularly slowed him down in terms of effectiveness for me, but I have to land on Blake Wheeler and we've talked about Blake Wheeler a lot and we've gotten to the point where you know, there was that stretch of games against Calgary and Vancouver where it seemed like every time Wheeler was on the ice, Winnipeg got scored on. Not only did they get scored on, but he was kind of on scene for the for the breakdown that led to the goal um, in a post game against Vancouver. I think it was he admitted when I asked the question, hey, uh, who was supposed to get who on this particular player? What were you trying to do? He said, actually, yeah, the guy, you know, he was mine and he was accountable for it. He said, you know, I, that was a shoulder check I missed. But then it kind of happened again a couple of times, not quite as clear cut. Paul Maurice threw a fit, um, threw his elbows around saying, you know, everything about this was horse shit and all that, all the criticism was un unfounded, but I don't think he was playing very well. And I think that that's the black and white of it is he simply was not playing very well. And then for me, he has played better. Absolutely. He has. He looks faster, not 2014 fast, but fast ish um and for 34 <laughs> yeah yeah that's fair to say like I don't think there was a time where he, he'd pick up the puck and he could go around people he could go through people um his first step was incredible and I think he's just sort of regressed to kind of an average NHL skater like you don't count on him to get separation speed anymore in a way that you used to I don't know if you remember things that, speaking of plays like the Ehlers one that just stick out in your brain but game six against St. Louis in the playoffs um, Winnipeg got trucked in that game. It was just all in, in the Jets zone, all in the Jets zone. Pro and Little connect for a last minute goal that brings the Jets within one, I think. And then the goalie stays pulled. Wheeler picks up the puck behind his own net. And it's like, okay, this is go time. This is franchise player who you can count on to, to plow through everybody on the way. He builds up speed. He's entering the neutral zone. He's doing his crossovers. And this is top flight Blake Wheeler and then Oscar Sundquist just pickpockets him and goes the other way with it and for me that was like in my mind this moment I'm going to overstate for the rest of my life as the moment that Blake Wheeler lost his ability to just decide to win um but he's still good I have to end on that I have to oh, end of course. on that. he's still a good player he's still a top six player to me yeah, like, I'm trying to think, like, I remember, like, a lot of people are like, oh, the 2017-18 team, a lot of it was luck. Like, we were really good that year. And I'm trying to think, like, it was around the All-Star break or Christmas time of that year, around when St. Louis fired their coach, that we kind of just sort of seemed to slow down a little bit. But I think it's interesting that that's kind of the point that you choose, because, yeah, he hasn't been, like, the Blake Wheeler since that time. But how can he be? He's literally 10 years older than most of the league's MVPs. Um are you one of the people that kind of believes that he should his 
he could equally, or bleh, I can't speak, he would be an equally impactful player as he was however many years ago if they were to modify his usage to be more power play and lesser five on five minutes and not putting him on the ice when we're down by one in the last five minutes of a game. Well, I mean, uh, he's picking up points uh, in that situation. So, and wait, so I, I hear the argument uh, and I see it go around Twitter a lot, you know, power play specialist, even strength reduce the minutes. And I think that honestly, Winnipeg has started him down that line. I mean, I don't think you're ever going to find more power play minutes for him because he's, you know, he anchors that top unit and they play as much as they do. So he's sort of maxed out as far as I'm concerned there. At five on five, I think it was roughly the beginning of February. You watch him from about 20, his total minutes, pardon me, not his five on five minutes, but this is where they were cut. His total minutes dropped from about 20 to 18. Um, so they've begun to to find opportunities to play him a little bit less. And, you know, I don't know if that corresponds with him looking faster. I think that's a health thing actually with this foot or what have you. Um, but all of this to say, I think that it's time to think of him not as the top line 20 plus minute a game right winger and more like a guy that helps you from the second line on five on five or the third line, maybe even if you're as deep as the Winnipeg Jets are. So that's my way of saying I mostly agree unless the person's conclusion is that he's 100% a power play specialist because I, I don't think the wheels have fallen off of him five on five. Right. And yeah, that makes sense, I think. And I, I can't think of one player in the NHL that is so anyone who's that powerful on the power play is not going to play three minutes of five on five in the rest of the game. Like it just doesn't seem to be a thing that would ever make sense. Um, so right now he's playing with Dubois and Shifley, who are arguably two of our best players, like I guess Connor and Ehlers could make that argument as well. But do you think that's a good fit for right now or for the long term? Or what are your thoughts on kind of that line and Blake Wheeler's spot there? I like it right now. I really do. I don't like it with a sense of permanence uh, because I would eventually like to see Pierre-Luc Dubois play center. And I think that that's why he was brought in. I think that's where Winnipeg is going to get the most mileage out of him. And he's not one of those tweener guys like, say, a Jack Rosovic was for Winnipeg, where it was he a center? Was he a winger? I mean, Pierre-Luc Dubois has a track record of success as a centerman. Um, so that's where I'd like to see him get to. Dubois on the wing now makes a little bit of sense to me, though, because when you miss two weeks of quarantine, when you come back, get hurt, miss another stretch of time, you know, the simplicity of a winger's game is a little bit greater. And if you're just trying to get a guy back up to speed and, and ramp him up, essentially, because as well as he's played offensively, I think you still see weird timing things happen from him. You see the puck bounce off of him at times, and he's still on his way back to acclimating, I think, to NHL speed. Uh, so I have no issue with Dubois on the wing right now. And then in terms of what kind of chemistry you want from him or for him in terms of his line mates, mates I like Wheeler and Shifley there because they're all kind of big guys who can protect the puck on the wall. Um, and Wheeler isn't necessarily going to need to be the zone entry guy or the one who always has the puck on his stick until, uh, until he can do something with it uh, in terms of protecting it on the wall, doing his spins, looking for, uh, for a cut into the middle. I think that kind of chemistry is still there. And, you know, whatever complaints we have about his speed, his brain and his hands, I think are still going. Right. Okay. I think that makes sense. And then, um, so then if you're looking long-term and you put um, Dubois either at 1C or 2C, maybe a 1A, 1B kind of thing, um, does that bump down Stastny or do you think they do a complete rearrangement of what the core, I can't speak, sorry, the current forward core looks like with the top six or top nine even? I think they'll continue to look for ways to get all of Shifley, Stastny, and Dubois top six minutes. I think that that's, it's just, I mean, they're in the early going. That's the tell. I think that we've seen that that is what Paul Maurice is looking to do. I don't mind the idea, especially because Winnipeg uses its fourth line so sparingly. I mean, if you're just going to accept that you have Nate Thompson and Trevor Lewis, and uh, you're, you're, if you're going to accept that your penalty killers are there, I see your face kind of go like, what about the youth? <laughs> um, but if that's the way it is, then then what's to stop you from running Shifley and then um, Stastny and Dubois or Shifley, Dubois, Stastny? You can easily put Adam Lowry on the wing or Adam Lowry in the middle with Dubois or Stastny on the wing or whoever it is. I mean, or Adam Lowry on the fourth line as well. I think there's the 
what I'm trying to say, I guess, is that when you have three centers that good, you might as well use them. And if you have so much forward depth and so many wingers who can play, you could run a top nine that is, in my opinion, overpowered if you play Stastny, Shifley, and Dubois all in the middle. And I just don't think, I don't think that's in the cards for the Jets. I think that they like that Lowry-based checking line. And um, so, yeah, I guess I don't know what to predict, actually, in terms of an answer for that. Yeah, and I think, well, like, the reason that you don't know what to predict the you don't know what to predict is because we have so many options that could legit play in competitive toxic top six roles. So I guess there are worse problems to have in that case. Um, but I just recently updated my header on Twitter. It's a Murat quote. I screenshotted it from the athletic and it says, but this season is to normal as NHL coaches are to playing young talent who might struggle ahead of veterans who already do. It simply doesn't compute. And I started that for a really long time. And I said, that's kind of my brand. Like that is just the way I feel like my life has gone for the past like four or five years. It just doesn't seem um, to be changing anytime soon. But Paul Maurice is not the only coach that falls victim to that. It's a very, very common thing in the NHL. Um, how are you kind of feeling about the whole Thompson slotting in, Veseline and, and Harkins coming out and Trevor Lewis coming, or sorry, Trevor Lewis has always been in, but Nate Thompson coming in to play on the penalty kill. And in his two or three games of being back, he's played 30 seconds on the six or seven kills that we've had yeah i mean first of all i have to say that that i mean that quote that you've got borrowed from me is like modified the idea of of playing players who might be good versus who aren't or that's floating around the internet and i don't know where it made its oh, way yeah brain, no so i've I heard modific- or different versions of that about a million times because it's it's so true and everyone says it <laughs> Yeah, okay, good, good. I just don't want to um, pretend to have originated the idea. But I agree with you that most coaches suffer from it a little bit. And I, I mean, I can't argue with you when you actually when you cite the ice time stats. I mean, if he's being brought in, and this is Nate Thompson we're talking about, if he's being brought in to kill penalties, well, clearly, he's not been brought in to kill penalties. I mean, the idea, I guess, is that if Copper Lowry or Lewis or Appleton take a penalty, then you slot Nate Thompson in. And it's like, well, if your role is that specialized, then what about reserving a specialized role for your Veselinans or your Gustafsons or your Harkins of the, of the world from whom development time will actually pay off for you later down the road, right? And, I mean, I go back and forth on whether young players, like even talk about Ville Hanela right now, where in his case, you know, waivers is not an issue. So many minutes for the most easy to get him. So I, as much as I think he has an NHL quality skill set at this point, for me, I'm not as stressed out about the fact that he's going to be playing massive minutes and in an important role. But then you get into the people who are floating, you know, taxi squad, injured, um, like the best line is Gustafson's Harkins. I'm like, what are they getting out of this? And, and what why would the that specialty role go to a player who's going to age out and unrestricted free agency himself out of long-term Jets contention when it could go into a player where whatever you get games-wise out of it feeds right back into the system? And the only reason I can think of is either the coach doesn't think they're good enough or I think sometimes human reasons get into it. So even though, I mean, numbers will show us this, a 19-year-old, a 20-year-old, 21, 22, they can have tremendous impact at the NHL level. Maybe there's some inconsistency as they ramp up to the strength of it. That's tough for me to quantify. But I think what happens in practice or what happens in terms of how much respect they command in the room influences how much respect they get from the coaching staff as well. And I think that in terms of learning to be a professional, learning practice habits, going first in drills, having a little bit of status within pecking order, consistently sort of being able to show that you understand what the coach is saying, whether you, you know, out loud, even if you're doing the right thing on the ice, but all of those little human things that go into sort of earning respect from somebody much higher up the pecking order to use that phrase again. I think that there's a lot of human reasons why coaches don't notice that their young players can play um, because they almost need to assert it for a long time and then just act like they already have the job before a coach will give it to them in a way. Right. Yeah. I actually do want to touch the latter of those two options that you said, because I was listening to Ken Weave and Sean Reynolds do their um, pregame 
um, discussion a few games ago, and I thought one of the points they brought up was really interesting, and I hadn't really thought of it that way. They were talking about, this was, I think, the first game that Thompson had slotted back in. Oh, no, it was the game before, and they were like, people, a lot of people had the name one reason why he should come in kind of thing. And what they had said is that when you have a guy like Nate Thompson, Nate Thompson does not have top six potential, and he knows what his role is. He's very comfortable in that role. That's his shtick is that bottom pair or sorry the bottom line penalty kill if he has to kind of go out there grind it out sort of thing whereas the guys that could go in are your vest linens and your harkins who do have the top six potential and they might be a little disgruntled if they only play three minutes a night they might not feel that that's the proper usage for them as a player and i thought that was kind of a cool point to bring up because maybe you want to wait and put them in when they're able to play 10 minutes a night at the very least kind of thing do you have anything that kind of like do you know do you get what i'm saying a little I I thought, what you're saying yeah like yeah if, if there is a role available like maybe wait until the role available looks like how the player sees themselves or envisions themselves a little bit for me if i'm if i'm the young guy and I'm i'm just hungry to play I think that every step closer towards minutes is positive for me so five minutes on the fourth line probably means more to me than the philosophy of me being in the press box you know or like for example like somebody in Logan Stanley's shoes right now where you know you see Hanel and Stamberg playing big minutes for the AHL and, and Logan Stanley could do the exact same thing he could dominate there or perhaps that would be a next that was the next step I imagined for him when this season is, is started but he came in he got his chance he's played well enough that now if you're him probably practicing skating on the taxi squad probably means a lot more because you see it as closer to that NHL job than, than that, that AHL time as well. So, so I'm not, I'm not too sure. Um, one example I can give, and I think I've only like the only time I've said this out loud, I don't think I've written this was, was in a question of Paul Maurice. And this is something that I noticed during training camp. And this is about asserting yourself into a job after every practice that I can remember Adam Lowry held himself a little skill session on the wall, like practice was over, but people would gather. Um, he would pick up pucks off the wall. There'd be a goalie there. They'd shoot, they'd skate. And they, they were really just trying to pick, pick pucks off the wall, move into a shooting position. And one by one, a group of young players started forming around him. Christian Veselainen, for the first time that I can remember, was one of the late guys after practice a whole bunch of times. But the guy that stapled himself to Adam Lowry, you never saw the two of them apart for me, was Mason Appleton. And for me, this was a smart move on that guy's, on that guy's part because you, you have Jack Rosovic at that time training in Columbus. You don't know what his future is. Um, there's a clear job opportunity. I think we all envisioned Kopp Lowry somebody. Appleton was probably first in line, but he was first in line last year and didn't necessarily seize the job, I thought. So here was a guy saying, okay, I'm going to demonstrate, I'm going to own that spot. Nobody is going to be more associated with that line than me. And I think coaches respond to that. I mean, maybe Appleton would have gotten the job anyway. I'm sure that like on merit, he's played well enough. That's to me, that's his job, but it would have been easy for Trevor Lewis to keep it. It would have been easy for a lot of other kind of combinations. And I just think that there's some of that human element of stuff that gives coaches confidence that, you know, they're busy worrying about their top six and systems and other sorts of things like that. Once you get down to the bottom six, maybe they almost don't want to make more decisions and they want it to be a little bit easier. This is just my philosophy. I don't know if it's true. I don't know if Paul Maurice would say that it's true. Interesting. Yeah. No, I'm not, I'm not sure. And I think that's a, that is a very valuable sort of thing to talk about how players can almost create their own destiny in the sense that they see a spot and they could totally jump at it. Um, sort of going back to the Nate Thompson thing or whatever. I know um, when we were doing um, an episode a couple of days ago, we were talking about how the whole good in the room, I hate hearing that phrase. It's just my least favorite phrase. And then someone's like, if he's good in the room, why can't he just stay there? Um, do you have anything that you could sort of jump like, if a guy does bring that leadership quality into the room, does it diminish if he's not playing on the ice? Like, can he still have that room impact if he just sits in the press box? Or does it kind of go hand in hand with being one of the guys on the team who's playing with the guys as opposed to just being in the press box and not actually being one of the top 12 forwards on the ice? For me, I mean, I laugh out loud at that line and it's a great one. Like, just stay stay there or what have you. And we've been having this conversation since Matt Hendricks, Mark Latesti, like every year there's a fourth line veteran of some kind. And, you know, you could even have it about Nathan Bolia right now on defense as well, in a similar way, not 
playing or not playing, maybe, depending on your opinion, but playing so far up the lineup, definitely, I think everybody would agree. Um, that said, so the question is, is there value? Can you still maintain that value without playing? I think to a degree you can, because practice habits, et cetera, et cetera. But for me, respect comes with the playing time. You know, like for me, and I, I think hockey teams are a little bit more militaristic than our day-to-day -day lives are, right? Where if Blake Wheeler or Mark Shifley is practicing or playing in a particular way or conveying a certain message, I feel like I listen to that more than if Dave, sorry, uh, Nate Thompson from the press box says the same thing. Nate Thompson on the fourth line and treated by everybody and all the leaders as like a meaningful part of the group. Like, unless I'm willing to have the conviction that this guy just cannot play whatsoever. And I don't think that a Hawk, I don't think that the guys in the room would feel that way. I, I would, I would value him. I would value his message more if he were playing than not. If Paul Maurice treated him like a valued member socially as if Paul, if Wheeler and Shifley and Connor and everybody else kind of did as well. Does that help you win games? I don't know. You know, I, I don't think, I don't think you need Nate Thompson's good in the roomness on the fourth line to help you win hockey games. I really don't, especially because, like I just said, I value it more when it comes from the guys who play better as well. Like, so for me, Blake Wheeler, Mark Shifley, Josh Morrissey, the guys who wear letters, Adam Lowry, and uh, you know Andrew Kopp's taking a leadership role. I want those guys to do whatever it is that's necessary that Nate Thompson is bringing and then play somebody who can outperform him uh, in his spot. That's kind of how I see it, um, but I don't know. Okay, so I, I do understand what you're saying. Um, you value the guys who do play a little bit more. So I guess Nathan Bolio is the most valuable player on this team right now. He's playing his <laughs> 25 minutes a game. <laughs> um, okay, what's going on there? I realize that the whole Pullman injury kind of just doesn't help the first one. And now this one, he's put in the IR today. I actually didn't see. I assume they called up Logan Stanley. Is that what they did? They did. Yep. Yeah. So um, do we know if he draws in tonight? Sorry, this is kind of just me derailing. Or is it going to be Niku again? Niku's playing again. Yeah, he is. Okay. So... And again, um, we talked about this on our post-game coverage um, after last game. We were talking about how this was the way to bring Niku back into the lineup. Like, obviously, Jets fans um, and a lot of people who are listeners of the podcast and kind of have similar mentalities to that of ours um, were very much on the free Niku train. Um, and then he played his first, whatever it was, five games or something, and he just was not very good. So he, he came out and people were like, okay, yeah, that is what it is. But then they brought him back in more sheltered third pairing minutes and playing with someone stable like Dylan DeMello. And he looked a lot better than playing with Josh Mer Morrissey, who hasn't been his best on the top pairing in the what season opener or something. It was a bit ridiculous. Like, I don't know, or second game of the season. Um, do you think it still makes sense to have Nathan Bolio in the lineup? Do you think it makes sense to keep Sammy Niku in right now? What are your thoughts on this decor? assuming we're not touching that second pair because we love them. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. My thoughts on the defense 100% protects that forward peon pairing. Um, uh, the Minnesotan magic. I needed alliteration. Um, <laughs> Josh Morrissey still, I think, deserves opportunities to play in that top four role and be the guy to an extent, but he's not carrying a pair the way Dustin Bufflin used to do. He's not even having the results that Morrissey Truba used to do, right? So I think first and foremost, anything, any decisions made about Winnipeg's defense should be about who plays with him. And for me, that's Dylan DeMello for miles and miles and miles. And um, when it, and then the third pairing for honestly, to me, could be just about anything. And the reason that I say that is you have Stanley having phenomenal results while there. You have Bolio having good results on the third pairing, but not further up. You have Dylan DeMello having great results on the third pairing. The Jets this season have sheltered their third pairing in terms of offensive play, in terms of offensive zone play, I should say, in terms of who they're matched up against more than at any point that I can remember. Like this is extreme sheltering for that third pairing. And I think that that Bolio Stanley or Stanley in particular was at the center of this. He has incredible results and he's played well but a lot of that is the degree to which they've sheltered them. So if you're going to throw the top four to the Wolves, Josh Morrissey needs help. Sammy Niku isn't that help. I think he needs that same sheltering Stanley benefited from. I, I, 
that never made sense to me at all, to tell you the truth. He was just thrown to the wolves. So Josh Morrissey needs a partner that can play those minutes. And Winnipeg seems to believe that Nathan Beaulieu's toughness and the fact that he plays sort of the right way in terms of blocking shots, doing the difficult thing, setting an example, somehow fit there, but they're both left-handed players. Beaulieu doesn't have a tremendous amount of puck skills. You've seen what happens when they're on the ice. I mean, they've been outchanced, outscored. The only pairing that Morrissey's had any success with was Dylan DeMello, even this season in roughly five games worth of minutes where they haven't all come together. He's, he's above 50% with DeMello and I think nobody else that's worth double checking. So that's the solution for me. Does Beaulieu come all the way out of the lineup? I think that that's was one of the cores of your question as well. I don't know, because now you've got the options of Beaulieu, Pullman on that third pairing, if you do it my way. Uh, if you, you know, Logan Stanley is perhaps an option. Maybe it's Stanley and Pullman who you prefer in that situation on that third sheltered pair. I know the Jets aren't going to, they're not entertaining that at all. And then my last, I always rant. You like, you're having like a nice, normal human conversation with me. And then I'm just like, here are everything I think about this. But um Winnipeg values Tucker Pullman a little bit more than I do. And I know that for a fact. I've talked to people inside the organization as far as ago as last season when he and Josh Morrissey were being essentially thrown to the wolves again. And their results were not good. And I really think Pullman's a guy that can add a lot of value when he's not being asked to defend against the Connor McDavid's and Austin Matthews of the world. And you leave that, that to Neil Pionk. <laughs> That's right, apparently. Apparently, Neil Pionk, the bully um, <laughs> against uh, McDavid. So anyway, so I just, you know, I, I guess I, I feel like I know that Pullman's going to get that job once again. And I feel like we've seen that the results show it, it won't go well. And Dylan DeMello will wait. Right. And so you put out a piece about the whole Dylan DeMello thing, because when we signed him, a lot of people were so excited because he is like, he last year he was probably when we brought him in going to be for the rest of the season had it not been canceled one of our more steady defensemen that you could rely on and he's been in a third pairing role ever since he came back like I understood at the beginning he missed the couple games and it happens like you same thing with Dubois you don't put him back into like you said throw him to the wolves but he's still there like what's why like <laughs> Why? <laughs> but why? Why? Um, yeah, I, I see it the same way you do. And I think it's really important that you acknowledge, like, at the beginning, yeah, he missed a few games. Um, and everybody had had the long layoff. Then he misses a few games. And you can sort of, you can really easily make the argument that, okay, let's baby step the guy back in. And even when he first began to, to play, I don't think that he excelled. You know, I the the things that he is great at those five foot passes reading the zone making sure that the pass goes to somebody with time and space all these little things that coordinate a zone exit um he wasn't dominant at those right out of the gate uh, there are a couple of physical battles he lost and it's like okay fine that's that's that was a realistic assessment i think of his entry back into the team but that's changed we're at the point now where he has become this third pairing safe space for these young players that automatically makes them succeed. Those exit passes can are, are back. And, you know, he's, he's rounded into form. And so I asked Paul Maurice about that yesterday after practice, you know, what is this guy going to have to do to uh, get more minutes? And I cited myself as a, an unabashed Dylan DeMello fan. And he said, well, he likes the way that he's playing, but, um, but, but Bolio has been good and Pullman has been good and all these other, so it was the kind of answer that didn't lend itself to criticizing the guy, but also firmly said that like that his spot in the depth chart is something that Maurice is completely content with. Um, so the why of it, I think that either the Jets are looking for balance in terms of a big guy and a puck mover on all three pairings. That's that's a bully on the top pairing argument that I'm, I'm just looking for to construct. Um, Another why, maybe they believe in Beaulieu's effectiveness at, despite being like, again, two lefties, the results have not been there. Maybe they just genuinely believe it. It could be that stuff we were talking about earlier where it's about the example he sets. Um, I, I can't find one that's, that, that's enough for me to say, no, Dylan DeMello shouldn't get that opportunity. I just, I'm trying to think from their perspective and I, I just can't find, I can't find your why. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
And then sort of continuing on with the defense thing, maybe we'll leave this alone afterwards because it seems to be one of the only things that people talk about with the Jets is the defense. But um, I there was one um, quote from Paul Maurice's media availability before last game where he said that Sammy Niku draws into the lineup because he is a good puck mover and Montreal four checks. And everyone was like, oh my gosh, breaking news, Montreal is the only team in the league that four checks and, <laughs> and puck movers are only important when you play against the Montreal Canadiens. A lot of people were very upset about that um, because we've seen that puck movers can be some of the most effective players in the ice. And we really thought that in that last game, our defense were really activated and they were very um, mobile and they had some great passes and some good activation there that um, we haven't seen a lot of this year. Um, do you have anything to sort of, cause I personally am not the kind of person who loves to harp on people specifically. Um, why exactly do you think that was what Maurice said and what makes sense about saying that in that context? I think to understand, yeah, I think that the, the play to understand the why on this is to zoom out and think politically for a moment. And there are so many times where, because I'm the gate, or not the gatekeeper, no, the messenger, that's the one I want, where I'm like, I type the quote during the press conference and then Twitter responds to it sometimes. I've seen this happen where, you know, a particular message gets torn apart like that one does. But if you're Paul Maurice and you're on the podium, um, and the question comes, you're in a position where you have to say something to the question, right? Why is Sami Niku playing today? What's the truth? I don't know what the truth is, but is he going to say, well, you know, uh, Tucker Pullman got hurt and, you know, we don't really value Niku in the long run. He's been passed by Billy Hanela and Dylan Sandberg, and he's not particularly, like, you know, he has to come up with some justification. And so something is going to come out of his mouth or, um, or back in the old days of other depth defenseman situation, he'll always say, you know what? Yeah, he's playing because, because you know, on merit. He won't, like, he's not going to take an opportunity to carve anybody in that moment. He's just going to say something that addresses the topic and then move on. Do I, and then this is why I use the word politics, is because I don't honestly sit there and expect what he's saying to be the literal truth. If you do need the coach to only speak in literal truths, you're going to have a lot to carve, I think because he is, to my way of thinking, a politician in that moment where he has to speak to the topic and he may or may not want to give you the goods on, on what the real answer is. Right. So he's not going to sit there and be like, yeah, we don't want to put Tucker Pullman on the IR and then that means we can't activate Logan Stanley and this is our only other option. So that's why he's in no other reason. Like he's, he's not going to say that. So <laughs> I guess, yeah, you're right in that sense. And that kind of actually touches on another topic that when I was mentioning to my podcast group, what we wanted to talk about today, someone had mentioned that there are, have been some inconsistencies between what Paul Maurice has said and then kind of what he ends up doing. And I think one of the big ones was at the beginning of the season, he's like, I don't want my young guys to rot in the press box. And then they did. And we're like, what gives man? Um, is there kind of some insight you can provide to that um, along the lines of what you'd said about the whole politics piece about where you can't take literal meaning from every single thing that he says, because in that moment, you have to come up with a better answer than the actual legitimate carved out truth. Yeah. I mean, that's a great question. I, I think with the, kids in the press box or kids, kids in the taxi squad thing. I think the answer that he gave it in camp, I mean, this is such interpretation on my part. And like, so why would you, this is just my, my version of, of interpretation. And um, I trust it, but you don't have to kind of, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, I think that was the thought out unchallenged answer. That was training camp. Nothing had happened yet. Everybody was healthy. The only thoughts he would have really had it into my way of thinking about the taxi squad were theoretically, what's its best usage? And so probably the idea of not letting kids get stuck there made a lot of sense to him. Um, but fast forward even a couple of days from that, and then now you have some injury concerns. Now you have like actual games to play and things like that. I think the coach falls back on his old habits of, okay, you trust the veterans, you know, like, yes, I want to develop these players. And I think he said this yesterday, but not, or oh, he said this today about fourth lions. He said, yes, you want to get them into the game, but not at the expense of the game. And I think he has that same perspective on breaking in the non-star youth sometimes too, where it's like, yes, I want to get them minutes and yes, I want to look out for them, but not at the expense of my, you know, the veterans that I trust or that end of roster penalty killer that I need that confidence from or whatever it is. 
And so I think that as soon as it was tested and as soon as injuries and all the rest, I mean, I guess I'm, I keep saying injuries, but injuries should be a reason why they get into the lineup as opposed to out. But I think as soon as it became about wins and losses, um, you know, when the shit hit the fan, so to speak, he kind of fell back on old habits. So his actions were not consistent. Let's let's not absolve him of that. His actions were absolutely not consistent. Um, now he has the moose. The moose are playing. And uh, so we're going to find out in the next little while whether to double down on criticism of that inconsistency or to see maybe, hey, maybe young guys do get their minutes now. Right. And yeah, I think that like, it's one of those situations where for me, again, not everyone has to agree with me, but you see that and you say, I want to break guys into the game, but not at the expense of the game. I personally don't think that Christian Veselainen is going to lose more. You're not going to lose more games with Christian Veselainen in the lineup than Nate Thompson. I bet you there's going to be a, like a no difference whatsoever, almost because of the limited usage there. But it just seems like one of those situations of the quote did make sense in that case, but the deployment of it didn't, if that if you understand kind of what I'm saying, not for that specifically, but I just think that might be the case with a lot of things where people just get frustrated with maybe understanding what he, the so-called good speaker, I agree, I think he's a great speaker, um, says versus what he does. And it's just, but I bet you, if you look at every team in the NHL, there's going to be some similarities in that sense that coaches aren't always going to be saying and then doing exactly what they say. Um, but anyways, um, enough of the, the Paul <laughs> I, uh, um, yeah, that's just been the topic of conversation for so long now, but, um, so we did have another kind of question about the expected goals model that we talk about a lot and that people use when they defend, um, why they like certain lines, why they dislike certain lines, different guys, people in the lineup. Um, so the Jets often, um, score more than their expected goals. Do you think there's anything in particular that kind of should be adjusted in that model, to make it more accurate since it's obviously only predictive and based on previous performance, but it hasn't been totally consistent with the Jets so far this year. Do you think there are any modifications or why do you think that's the case is probably a better question. Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, the purpose of, I think, most expected goals models are to sort of quantify and then standardize how dangerous a scoring chance actually is, right? Because I think I mean, everybody's eye test is different, but I think an eye test that watched every Jets game would give you a reasonably good sense of a better sense, part of me, than expected goals uh, of how dangerous on any one night a chance was, right? Because you know whether or not there was a screen, you know, you can see Kyle Connor's eyes or his hands or, or what these details that aren't going to get caught in an expected goals model. Um, but because expected goal standardizes all this, we can compare Kyle Connor, who you watch, you know, 20 minutes a night, 82 times a season versus Brock Besser or versus William Nylander. And to give a standardized version of, you know, what a scoring chance is helps actually make an informed um, comparison. I think that's where a lot of the value comes from. In a lot of years, expected goals will go on to predict future goals better than, than real goals do. So if a team plays five games and, you know, in those five games, they outscore the other teams 25, 15, but only have 40% of expected goals. Historically, that was shown that their future goal performance would follow expected goals more than real goals. That's not necessarily, I, it's been a while since I've looked at it, but I'm not sure that that was the case last season. And so there's always going to be room for criticism and room for improvement. Um, and so then I get into like, how do they work? Why? Why expected goals? A money puck's going to give you slightly different things that go into an expected goal, natural stat trick, uh, evolving hockey. Their formulas are all different, but one thing that they have in common is that they are back tested against past goals. So they look at historical goals and all the different factors that you can measure that went into it. Was it a one timer? Where did it come from? What was the angle of it? Was it a slap shot or a wrist shot? All these things available in play by play. Was there another shot within a few seconds of it? Where was there another event like a hit within a few seconds in a completely other, different zone? Because that gives you a sense that there's transition play involved. Like they're using all of these, I'm going to call them workarounds or proxies for what makes something dangerous that their script can pull out of NHL play by play code. Your eye is going to know where did this pass come from? Who passed it? Was it on this, like, um, 
was the timing of it in his wheelhouse or was there something offbeat? Like every, your eyes will tell you so, so much more than that. The advantage that the Jets will have in terms of their expected goals models is that they have more, they have pre-shot passing available to them and they have a few other kind of bells and whistles and their version of expected goals will be more accurate by a few percentage points, not a sea change, but they will be slightly more accurate than what we get publicly. Um, so to tie that back to, I mean, Winnipeg's often outscored its expected goals and why that happens is finishing and goaltending. So you either need to decide whether you believe Winnipeg's finishers will always outperform their expected goals. And maybe when you have Mark Shifley on the ice, people consistently do. Um, obviously not the case with Nate Thompson or Trevor Lewis. And then defensively, you look at the quality of chance Winnipeg gives up. And are they always going to outperform their expected goals? I think that I think Connor Hellebuck is a bigger part of that conversation than any math wizardry. I think it's just as simple as the Jets goaltending haven't been excellent. And when you put those two things together, great finishers and a goalie who's been playing out of his mind, well, then you will outperform it. It's just, can you bank on that? Is giving up that quality of chance so often, getting out shots so often, is that bankable? And so then you'd have to really double down and dial into watching with your eyes the exact types of chance that they create and give up. And I don't think there's magic in, in what the Jets are doing relative to another team, but maybe you can find some. Right. Yeah. And I do think that's kind of um, a point sort of to be reckoned with is that whole concept of the variable of Connor Hellebuck, that it has such an impact on the expected goals and, oh, maybe we are outscoring it. But as soon as he plays poorly for five or six games, all of a sudden we're probably going to be at the level of the stats. Right. So I don't know. I, I don't know. I do think that's interesting, though, that the there are so many things that could change um, based on the previous games if. Connor Hellbuck doesn't stand on his head. And if Mark Shifley and Cal Connor aren't Mark Shifley and Cal Connor. <laughs> yeah. Oh, were you going to say something? Sorry. <laughs> I, you know, I, I began to ramp up and then I thought I was interrupting. So we're, we'll put that aside. No, where were you going? Pardon me. Oh, I was just going to, I was just thinking of um, stats, generally speaking. And a lot of people like to talk about the, the stats padding of the empty net goals with um, some of our, Blake Wheeler and Mark Shifley. Mark Shifley, not so much anymore. He's really picked up his game, I found personally, in the past um, few games. But I really just, that that's the one thing that I do have my criticisms of coaching and this, that, whatever. But the one that has never made sense to me is why you would put on two of your biggest defensive liabilities to defend a six on five at the end of a game when you could put on someone who kills a penalty and can also shoot the puck 100 feet down the ice and score a goal too. What, what is the defense for for doing that like why why do we do that <laughs> um i i don't the truth is i don't know the honest truth is i don't know why shifley and wheeler would be your go-to people in that case i think i looked at the numbers on it recently somebody had asked about it in a mailbag and i was looking at the the shot rates and goal rates against them with the opposing goalie pulled versus others and I was like okay well if they're worse defensively what if you gave those minutes to somebody else and I found it was one of those things that just was not functionally significant in the end you could project it over a season and there was not that many like the the goal swing wasn't like I guess I, I went into it wanting to rage at the idea and I came out of it being like oh there isn't really a lot of difference here in the end and I wonder if like, I wonder if it's just a sense of, again, the human element where during five on five play, I'm making this up. I don't know if this is true. So this may not be fair to a Mark Shifley, for example. Um, but maybe during five on five play with a back and forth element to it and transition element to it, maybe you'll catch him cheating a back check from time to time, or maybe you'll catch him cheating, a getting below his man in, in terms of a defensive assignment from time to time, because there's the you know, the desire to go and play offense in the other direction. I think that's something he's improved a little bit of late, but it's still a latent criticism of his game. And maybe at six on five, the game is so obviously a yard sale that you'll get better performance. Like if we're going to carve those two players or Kyle Connor, whoever's joining them um, during six on five, I think we need to isolate their defensive play to six on five, because I feel like it's a completely different game. And I would, I would be willing to believe, even if I end up being wrong, if we prove me wrong later, I'd be willing to believe that they can shut it down and, and at least perform capably. I don't know. How did that sound? 
I, yeah, sounds good. Again, I have absolutely no reason to understand why. So literally the smallest bit of um, <laughs> make sense to me. Sounds good. <laughs> um, that's kind of all I've got uh, for today. We kind of came into this just hoping to have a chat sort of about what's been going on. We've been trying to put out some more episodes lately and try some new things. We've been doing some post game stuff. Um, I actually do want to quickly mention that we do have an episode sponsor that I'm going to plug right now. So Vertical Adventures is our new partner, as some of you might know. Um, they're Winnipeg's premier indoor rock climbing gym. They provide a fun, vibrant, inclusive environment so everyone can reach new heights. Um, they're now booking one-on-one -on -one climbing sessions because that totally fits within the new restrictions um, with their coaches. So you also get to pick the price. You donate what's fair to the coaches and you can book at verticaladventures.ca for more information and to book your reservation. We saw Melissa Martin went and she had a lot of fun. It was really cool to see that. And um, yeah, so highly recommend checking that out um, if you get the chance. Um, Marat, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join me today. Uh, it's always fun, always great to hear new insight from you. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. That's a, lots of fun. Thank you. Great.